theyeshiva.net. So a woman once approaches me and asks me if I could find the perfect husband for her. Who's laughing, the men or the women? <laughs> if you don't tell, I won't tell. I say to her, I would love to, but you need to define to me who is the perfect husband. One woman's perfect husband is another woman's terrorist. <laughs> she says, Rabbi Jacobson, for me, the perfect husband is someone who wakes up five o'clock in the morning, makes his own breakfast, does his own laundry, exercises two hours a day, spends only seven minutes on the web daily, sits in a library for a long time, is completely predictable, consistent, reliable, and I always know where he is. Cleans his own room, does his own laundry, all meals are on him, doesn't drink, ever. Doesn't have a social life. At nine o'clock p.m., every night he's in bed. That's the perfect husband, Rabbi Waiwai. Do you think you can find him for me? I said, absolutely. She said, there are such men? I said, yeah. She said, where? I said, in prison. I just got it. <laughs> like every Jewish anecdote, it also has a relevant, emotional, and spiritual and Jewish application. When I think about tonight's evening, one week prior to the 29th yard site, the anniversary of the passing of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, my mind, my imagination takes me back to a scene in the Bible, in the Hebrew Bible, in the Torah, in the Tanakh, in the book of Kings, Kings 2, chapter 2. One of the most influential and towering prophets and sages in Jewish history is Elijah. Eliyahu Hanavi, the prophet Elijah. And Elijah's closest disciple is another prophet named Elisha, Elisha. And the Tanakh, in one of the most moving scenes, describes the day Elijah knows he's going to die. And he knows, like we all know, that there is one journey we can only take alone. Nobody can escort us on that journey, even those who love us most and whom we love most. And Elijah tells Elisha, it's time for me to cross the Jordan alone. And Elisha says, I swear I will never leave you. They cross the Jordan River together. And then Elijah turns to his student, his beloved disciple, Elisha, Elisha. And he says those fateful words. Sha'al ma eselach. Ask me for something that I can do for you before I'm taken from you. And Elisha doesn't skip a beat. He tells his Rebbe, his master, his teacher, his prophet, Elijah, he says, Would you give me and confer upon me a double portion of your spirit. And Elijah doesn't say sure. You know what he says? Like a good Jew. He says, That's a tough one. <laughs> That's a tough one. My son, you're asking for something very gigantic, very titanic. And he doesn't just say, I'm going to do it. He makes a condition. If you can see me being taken from you, 
that will be the case. You will get a double portion of my spirit. If not, not. And moments later, there is a stormy fire and Elijah ascends in this heavenly fire and Elisha sees it and he cries out, Ovi, Ovi, Rechev Yisrael Ufaroshev. My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. And he rents, tearing his garments. But he saw Elijah being taken. And as the story continues, he did indeed receive a double portion of his spirit. But what does that mean? If you see me taken from you, you will get a double portion. If not, not. And one of the most majestic commentaries is this. If you will be able to see me after I'm taken from you, that means you have a double portion of my spirit. If you will still be able to sense my soul, internalize my vision, truly appreciate my teachings, my thoughts, my faith, my life, if my vision becomes yours, my dream becomes yours, it means you received a double portion of my spirit. So as I speak to you this evening, my dearest friends, I, on behalf of I think all of my colleagues in this beautiful John Adams Playhouse at Hofstra University, on behalf of colleagues the world over, on behalf of the Jewish people, I think we can also stage this request. Can a double portion of the great spirit of the legendary Lubavitcher Rebbe be conferred on you, on me, on I, on, on me, on us? And tonight, in my mind's eye, I see three aspects of that great spirit, of that great life, of this gigantic soul that was, as Rabbi Jonathan Sachs once said, the smile that God gave the Jewish people after Auschwitz. Number one, the Rebbe passed away on Saturday night, Metzoy Shabbos, the new Torah portion was Chukas. It was the third of Tammuz, Sunday at dawn. The Torah portion of Chukas. In fact, this year, the yard site, the third of Tammuz on Thursday in Israel, they'll be reading the portion of Chukas. The Torah portion of Chukas begins with that mitzvah, which is the quintessential Jewish mystery known as the red heifer, the para aduma, the red cow. And it talks about a very strange, mysterious ritual where they chose a red cow. They offered it. They slaughtered it. It was burnt, transformed into ashes. The ashes were mixed with living water of a well, from a wellspring. And that mixture of ashes and water was sprinkled on anyone who came in contact with a corpse, with death, and became defiled by it. And this mixture purified them. It's a difficult mitzvah to fathom and comprehend. And I asked myself, by providence, why did the Rebbe finish his journey on this world? His soul ascended to its Father in heaven. On this Torah portion, when he was the man who almost at every event would quote his great-great-grandfather, the Alter Rebbe, Rabbi Shnei Zalman of Eliyadeh, who used to say, you got to live with the times. And when they asked him, what does it mean to live with the times? For some Jews, it used to mean live with the New York Times. But in the 18th century in Belarus, <laughs> what does living with the times mean? Living with what the Tsar Paul or Alexander <laughs> is thinking about, and the Alter Rebbe explained with the Torah portion of the week. That's called living with the times. It contains the rhythm the heartbeat of Jewish life and of Jewish events. And then I realized that in many ways this mitzvah captured one of the greatest contributions and perspectives of the Rebbe. Because 
What does water represent? Water represents the beginning of life. Every fetus develops in the amniotic sac in the womb of its mother, enveloped by water, by a mikvah, by a spiritual and physical pool of water in its mother's womb. And as we continue life, 70% of each cell of your 50 or 60 trillion cells is made up of water. 66% of the body is water. Water represents the beginning of life, the continuity of life. There's nothing like a cold glass of water on a hot summer day to quench one's thirst and revive your spirit. What does ashes represent? Ashes represent the end. When something is destroyed, burnt, consumed in flames, what is the residue? What is left over? Nothing but ashes. It's why on the ninth of Av, right before the great fast day of Judaism, when we mourn the destruction of the temple, there's a custom by many to dip an egg in ashes. Many a groom under the chuppah, under the wedding canopy, they have a little ashes under their keeper to remember the destruction of the temple, the destruction of Jerusalem, and the pain and violence and bloodshed that still exists in the world. Comes Judaism and says, if you want to cleanse yourself from the greatest of pains and from the greatest of mysteries, the mystery of death, you need to learn how to mix ashes with water. Ashes is the end, representing death. Water is the beginning, representing life. The Rebbe had that unique skill to know how to mix ashes with water. And this was no symbol when he became the leader of Chabad in 1950. Because it was five years after the souls of six million of our brothers and sisters after their lives and bodies were reduced to mounds and mounds and mounds of ashes. You can visit today, eight decades later, Maidanek. You can visit Treblinka. And in some of the death camps, you can still see mountains of ashes with tiny particles of bones. Can any nation rise from such darkness? from such bleakness, from such despair. The Jewish people was shush. The Jewish people were shattered physically, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually. Hundreds and hundreds of communities destroyed. A million and a half children gassed. And it was at that moment that divine providence demonstrated grace to his people. And one of those great gifts or smiles was the soul of the Lubavitcher Rebbe who had that uncanny ability to teach people how to transform crisis into opportunity. It's only in the Hebrew language where the same word that we use for a breakdown, you know how you say a breakdown in English? In Hebrew. Right, mashber. Mashber. You know what mashber also means in Hebrew? A birthing stool. Isha Yoshevet al hamashber, the woman sitting on a birthing stool. Because in the Jewish belt on Shaung, the Rebbe taught every crisis, every challenge is essentially an opportunity for rejuvenation, for rebirth, for a renaissance. One window closes, another one opens, one door closes. And another one opens. Quoting the words of King David in Hallel and Psalms. The Rebbe vitalized the nation. And collectively empowered so many hundreds of thousands and millions. To declare those immortal, immortal words of King David. Loi omus ki echia. I will not die. I will live. And he stood up, 1950 was the year his father-in-law passed. And he became a young Lubavitcher Rebbe in Brooklyn. Somebody who was alive then, I was born a little later. Tommy he still remembers the Rebbe coming into shul in 1951 or 52 and taking the tablecloth and putting it out himself on the table. So you should be able to sit down and speak to a few people. 
Who did he have? Most of his own followers, disciples, and relatives either were killed by Hitler or sent to Stalin's gulags or were just stuck in the Soviet Union for decades. But that ability to be able to steer the ashes in the eyes and say, we're going to seek to transform this crisis into the greatest opportunity, creating an unprecedented revival in Jewish consciousness and in Jewish life. This became not only the marching orders, but the gift that the Rebbe gave and continues to give so many in their personal lives. Which life is not plagued by darkness, by trauma, by brokenness, by crisis? The only people I know who are perfect are the people I don't know. The only marriages I know that are perfect are the marriages I don't know. Besides my wife's marriage. <laughs> working, I'm working on it. Every person in their own life has the ashes that you and I have to face alone. But the Rebbe taught and inspired a generation how to be able to look at those ashes and say, there is also a unique calling, a unique mission for you to learn something from this moment, but bring the water into the ashes. Don't ignore the ashes. Don't repress the ashes. Don't bury the ashes. Don't deny the ashes. They actually had to preserve the ashes. With TLC, with tender love and care, but bring the water into the ashes. Let the end become a new beginning. He learned this from Jacob. Jacob was facing a mysterious adversary in the middle of the night in Genesis. What is our name? Our name is Yisrael, Israel. Where did we get that name? It was that night when Jacob was facing an adversary who tried to kill him. And when he couldn't kill him, he maimed him. He made him limp. And finally, dawn broke. And this strange adversary, the first great anti-Semite in history, turns to Jacob and says, it's dawn, I need to leave. And Jacob says, Lo I will not let you go until you don't bless me. And that's when he changes his name from Yaakov to Yisrael, from Jacob to Israel. That's where we all have our name from. And I ask you a question. If somebody attacks you in a dark alley and tries to kill you all night, and in the morning he's finally leaving, do you say, wait, I need a bracha. Wait, I'm not letting you go till you bless me. Come on. Call 911, punch him in the face. All the martial arts that you've been studying for 29 years, use it, execute Call Hatzalah if you're really Jewish. <laughs> Call the caterer to prepare the, the feast. What's this thing? I need a blessing from a gangster. But Jacob was really teaching the Jewish people one of the greatest ingredients of Jewish survival and success. And that is, when you face a challenge in life, you don't only want to get rid of it. Because if the whole purpose was to get rid of it, why did God send it to me in the first place? I want to look the challenge in the eye and say, I will not let you go until you do not bless me. I want to emerge from this experience more authentic, more blessed, more wise, more deep, more sensitive, more sacred, more divine, more real. There's another component in the spirit of the Rebbe that I yearn and I pray I and you and we should be able to see tonight. And this has to do with a very fascinating phenomenon that I always noticed. The Rebbe was a very holy man. He spoke publicly for 50 years and you could never hear from him a word of gossip, a word of slander, a word of negativity about anybody. It's not like he didn't have strong opinions. <laughs> He had strong opinions and he shared them. But you could never... I watched, I watched myself for, for two decades, almost two decades. You saw how careful he was. He was in his imagination and his, in his reality, he was in God's presence every moment. And he behaved that way. Centered, balanced, responsible, focused. You know, with many leaders... I should say many celebrities especially, from a distance, we idolize them. Once you get to know them, what happens? It's like their wives. What do the wi most wives think about celebrities who they're married to? 
You don't have to all answer. How do you distinguish a really great leader? The closer you get to know them, the more reverence you have. The Rebbe was that type of person. The more you got close to him, the more reverence you had. You would think such a person would be judgmental. God-fearing people, tzaddikim, should be very judgmental people because they're so meticulous. They're such, they're in awe of God. There was something unique about the Rebbe and that is, I always saw almost anybody was comfortable to tell him anything about their lives without any reservation. You know, how long does it take to build a friendship, trust, where you can open up and spill the beans and really think out loud? Would the Rebbe people seem to have that comfort and literally share the most intimate, dark skeletons, ghosts, demons, and secrets about their lives? Negative, positive, from the past, from the present, emotional, psychological, physical, spiritual, financial, mistakes, sins, transgressions. Why? The answer is, you did not feel even an iota of judgment. He would share with you what he thought, but he had that masterful ability, decades before it was spoken about, to hold space for another soul without even an iota of judgment. To be able to tune in to a person and make them feel that their dignity is absolute and non-negotiable and you knew that there's nothing you can tell him that will make him change his essential opinion about you and say to himself, what a moronic idiot. What a jerk. Get out of my life. Get out of 770. There was nothing you could say that would shock him to the point where I cannot deal with Meshuganas like you. I even remember once there was a person, he died already, and he was emotionally very, very unstable. And the Rebbe was walking into the synagogue, and he went over to the Rebbe, and he gave him an envelope. Now, I knew that what that person wrote in the envelope is probably pure, absurd hallucinations. And indeed, one of the Rebbe's secretaries, Rabbi Groner, chopped the envelope from this fellow, because he probably wanted to read it before he gives it to the Rebbe. I'll never forget the stern gaze the Rebbe gave to his secretary as he stretched out his hand and took the envelope. He did not want anybody to come in between. This person wants to write to me, whatever he wants to write to me, he shall have that ability. No filters, no intermediaries. But people felt that safety. Can I learn from that tonight? Can I learn to be able to create that safety for other people? Safety is romance. Safety is much deeper than you'll ever imagine. It's really tuning in to another person's soul, mind, cry, experience, feeling without the need to impose my emotions, my judgment, my opinions, my perspectives, to really hold space for who you are and that's where the miracle of attachment and relationships happen. I'll tell you the last words I heard from the Lubavitcher Rebbe. I was traveling to Israel. It was March 1992. It was the 26th day of other one. 92, as I said. The Rebbe would distribute dollars every Sunday for six, seven hours to anybody who wanted to come. Jews would come, non-Jews from all walks of life. They have a lot of videos that they show from these encounters. He would give everybody a dollar to give to charity and a blessing. And people would sometimes have a an exchange with him, a short exchange, because there could be 5, 10, 15, 20,000 people online. It was Sunday. I didn't know it would be the last time he would ever be able to distribute dollars. The Rebbe was 89 years old. He was turning 90 in a month and a half. And I was online, and in front of me, there was a father. He looked like a French Jew did not come from the Chabad community, was not dressed like a Hasidic or even observant Jew. And he was holding a little girl. She was very cute. 
She seemed to me somewhere between four or six, four or five or six years old. And the Rebbe gave him a dollar, and he gave her a dollar, and he said to this little girl, French Jewish girl, Brachava Hatzlacha, blessing and success. At which point she shocked everybody in the room as she looked the Rebbe in the eyes and she said these words, and I heard it with my own mouth. I was right there. I heard it with my own ears, actually. She said it with her own mouth. I heard it with my own ears. She said in a French accent, but in English, Rebbe of Lubavitch, I love you. <laughs> with a big smile. Now, there were some men over there who I saw were uncomfortable. That was not usually what somebody, not from the male gender or the female gender, would tell the Rebbe, I love you. But this is what she said. Now, I saw the Rebbe smile many times, but the way I saw him smile that day was absolutely unique. There was like an angelic smile on his face. He was quelling. And as she was about to move on with her father, he took a second dollar, he gave it to her. He looked her straight in the eyes and he said, this is for your love. Then came my turn, he grew serious. <laughs> Smile was off. <laughs> His secretary, Rabbi Groner, told the Rebbe that I was traveling that night to the Holy Land. He gave me a dollar and he said, blessings and success. And he gave me a second dollar and he says, Ab -geben in Eretz HaKodesh. give this for charity in the Holy Land. Those were the last words I heard from my Rebbe. The next day he went to the Montefiore Cemetery in Queens to pray at the resting place of his father-in-law, as he would do twice a week. And there, Monday, around 6 in the evening, he suffered a massive stroke from which he didn't recover. And two years later, in, in uh, June 94, the 3rd of Tammuz, he returned his holy soul to its maker. It was only today, when I shared the memory of this story with my wife, she pointed something out to me that I thought was so profound. If somebody would tell me, I love you, what do you usually say in America? I love you too, right? I love you. No, I love you. You love me. I love you. you shalom Aleichem, Aleichem Shalom. I love you. I love you. I love you, but I love you, right? That's romance. Or, 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 at least, thank you so much. That means so much to be loved by you. The Rebbe didn't say either. <laughs> he didn't say thank you very much. Nor did he say I love you. He said something else. He said this is for your love. And my wife told me, you see, that's called holding space. He didn't talk about his experience. He, talk about, he spoke about her experience. He didn't say thank you for what you gave me. I'm sure he was thankful. I saw that he was thankful. He didn't even speak about his love. He gave her a dollar and he said, this is for your love. That five-year-old girl got the gift of somebody who allowed her soul to shine. That's the miracle of holding real space for people. It's one of the most important things in relationships with your children, with your friends, and especially with your spouse, whom you have all opinions already formed for 29 and a half years. After all, you know your husband like nobody else. You know your wife like nobody else. You've been to every psychiatrist and psychologist and therapist for 35 years. And I say the Jewish people are divided into three groups. Neurotics, psychotics, and psychiatrists. <laughs> the neurotics build castles in the air. The psychotics live in them. The psychiatrists collect the rent from both of them. <laughs> but in a marriage, what would it mean to really, really hold empathetic space for another person, for your spouse? It sounds easier than it's done. It's the ability to go out of my prejudice, out of my ego, out of my trauma, out of my opinions, out of my perspectives, out of my brilliance, out of my emotions, out of my interpretations. And tune in to your love. Tune in to your soul. Tune into your pain. Tune into your experience. I was once 12 o'clock midnight in a grocery store in the Crown Heights section of Brooklyn. My wife sent me to buy Pampers. 
You see, I'm a good guy. I practice what I preach. So it's 12 o'clock midnight. I'm buying Pampers. I still remember Cult of Grocery, Kingston Avenue, Crown Heights. And who do I see in one of the aisles? A man by the name of Schellenberg Gansberg may have a complete recovery. He worked as an assistant. He worked in the Rebbe's home on President Street for approximately 40 years. Very quiet man. He barely said a word. But I thought it's midnight. It's a different energy. And there was nobody in the stores. I said, Rebbe Schellenberg. Tell me something about the Rebbe that I don't know. Tell me something you saw in the house. And he always had the same answer. I didn't see anything. I said, come on. He said, yeah, yeah, I don't know anything. He tells me, you think I'm smart like you, Jacobson? I don't understand anything. I don't remember anything. He says, why do you think I was hired? Do you think they would hire somebody who has a head? He told me, ich verstehe gar nicht, ich weiß gar nicht. And he says, even if I knew something, I don't even know how to say it. I'm like, okay, the Rebbe knew who to hire. <laughs> or his wife, actually, the Rebbe. But I asked him a question. I said, let me ask you a question. Just answer me the question. The Rebbe's wife's name was Chaya Mushka. She passed away six years before the Rebbe, 1988. He was very broken after her passing. They were married almost 60 years, and they didn't have children. They didn't have biological children. They were very, very close. And I said, Shalom Bear, what did the Rebbe call his wife? How did he call her in the house? Musya, Musi, Chaya, Mushka, Chaya Mushka. I, I was just interested. I was curious. He looks at me and says, I don't know. I'm like, don't tell me you don't know. You were 40 years in the house. There was a husband and a wife. He, he says, I don't know. I said, just tell me, you don't want to tell me. Don't say, I don't know. He says, I'm being honest, I don't know. I said, well, you never saw the Rebbe on the couch? And he wanted to ask his wife something, and he said, Musya, or Chaya Mushka, or Mushka. And he looked at me, and this is what he said. He said, 40 years in the house, never did the Rebbe call his wife by her name to come to him. If he needed something, he stood up, and he went over to her. And he asked her what he needed, so he never called her by the name because he just approached her. That's why I never heard how he called her by the name. I'm like, you mean he never sat and said, do you mind bringing me a cup of tea? I want to ask you a question. What's going on? He said, never. He would stand up, walk over to her, and never asked her to come to him. So he says, I don't know what he called her. And what happened in the privacy of their bedroom, he says, I wouldn't know. But in the dining room, in the kitchen, in the living room, that never happened. I was shocked. Shared with me that the Rebbe would come to his office in the morning. Before he left his house, he would tell his wife what time he's going to be home. You ever heard of that custom? But listen to this. Listen to this. The Rebbe's secretary, a grown told this to me directly. He said, if the Rebbe saw, let's say he told you he's going to be home 8 o'clock. If he saw that he's going to be home by 8 or latest, by 8.09 or 8.10, that was fine. But if he saw that he's going to be 10 minutes or more than 10 minutes late, he would call her to tell her that he's going to be late more than 10 minutes. Every single day. He also told me that Ebba would finish a fabrengen, a gathering, speak for three, four, five, six hours. And the first thing he would do, he would come to his room, he would call his wife and say, I'm okay. I survived. Holding space, holding space for people without judgment. That's where the miracles of love and relationships happen. I could still hear those words, this is for your love. And finally, and finally, there is that third element in the Rebbe spirit. And that is, Whenever I heard the Rebbe, if he spoke to individuals, or he spoke to the community, or he spoke to the world, or he wrote to the Jewish world, there was always a common theme. He was never satisfied, and it bothered people. Somebody once said, you know, why doesn't the Rebbe just look at his chassidim and say, you guys are so amazing, chill out, relax, you're doing well. Serenity is the most important thing. And you know, calm down. 
this Chabad fire and passion and every Monday a new Chabad house and every Thursday two new Chabad houses and every year another thousand shluch. Just relax. I still remember one Hanukkah. The only time I heard the Rebbe compliment his disciples. I never heard him compliment them. He said, this year, the Hanukkah campaign and the menorahs, he says, it was successful. You guys did a good job, but so much more can be done. <laughs> Typical of Rebbe. And some people felt, I don't know, like the, 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 this guilt or this, this tension, but they really missed the point. Imagine Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart growing up in a home without a piano. What would have happened to his creativity? What would have happened to his genius? Anybody imagines? I don't know, but probably he would be making fires, burning down the school, driving the principals crazy. There was once a man who came to Mozart and he says, my daughter is three years old. Is it a good time to start teaching her Piano. He said, three? Why don't you wait till she's seven or eight? He says, you started at three. Mozart said, but I didn't ask. <laughs> Thank God he had a piano. But let's say he didn't. And he grew up without any awareness of his genius, of his talent. And he really squandered his life, maybe doing fine things, but not expressing who he really was. And then one day, he would walk into the office of a master, a maestro. And there was a piano there. And he would sit down and start playing the piano. And the maestro would call him in and say, I don't know what you're doing for a living. Maybe you're selling buildings. Maybe you're buying buildings. Maybe you're a respectable lawyer or accountant. Maybe you're a rabbi. I don't know. As Jackie Mason, Oliver Shalom used to say, he's the guy who would repeat many of my jokes. Um, you say, if you're born, if you're a normal kid, your mother, Jewish mother says a doctor. If you're a little slow, a lawyer. If you're really slow, an accountant. If you're a Michigana, a rabbi. So this guy would turn to Shakespeare and say, you know, you may have a good job, but I want you to know you can change the world. And Shakespeare would say, who? You, you can change the world. This person would not be trying to make Shakespeare feel guilty. He would be trying to allow Shakespeare to shine and change the world. Well, the Rebbe saw every person and every Jew as a little Shakespeare. And he really believed it. So when he saw a person, he did not see smallness. He saw infinity. He saw divinity. I look at myself in the mirror and I may see trauma. And I may be right. And you may agree with me. And my wife will certainly agree with me. And my mother-in-law will even agree more with me. And my therapist is making a living off my trauma, so he'll certainly agree with me. The Rebbe also saw trauma. He saw it very well. He was not a naive man. He saw a lot of pain. He saw a lot, a lot of pain. He saw the ashes. But he always saw the ability of people to pour the water on the ashes. So when he saw individuals, or when he saw a collective body, he could not contain himself of turning to the individual, or to the community, or to the people, or to the world, and saying, do you realize that your music can transform the landscape of planet Earth? That was a third priceless gift that the Rebbe gave us. The Rebbe continues to inspire his students in the Jewish world with. Finally, there's a fellow, he lives in Beverly Hills in California, his name is David Weiss. He was once by the Rebbe. He shared the story himself. And he told the Rebbe, you know, I don't look like one of your disciples. I'm not a Chabadnik, I'm not very observant, I don't dress like your guys. But I would be interested to know, what would it take to become your chassid? What would I need to do that you should be proud to call me your student? And he said, without skipping a beat, the Rebbe looked at him and said, I'll tell you the criteria. A human being who at the end of the day can look in the mirror and say, 
today, from when I woke up till now, I tried to challenge myself, to grow, even advance one step in my authenticity, in my truth, in my Yiddishkeit, in my Torah, in my mitzvahs, in my goodness, in my kindness, in my empathy, in my compassion. I try to advance even one step. These are the words this person tells himself or herself before they retire in bed. He says, such a person, I will call my chassad. And I say tonight, when I watch in this room the hundred, more than 100 emissaries that the Rebbe has sent throughout Long Island, the wives and the husbands who built 55 amazing Chabad centers in Long Island, when I look at these centers and these shluchim, and I look at all of you, I could say that the request of Elisha to Elijah was fulfilled. A double portion of the Lubavitcher Rebbe's soul was conferred upon us. And I turn to my dear colleagues and say, let that double portion of the Rebbe's spirit continue to invigorate you, empower you, transform you, and allow each of us, each night before we go to sleep, to say, I try today to advance one step in bringing divine light into a world that craves to place its mouth on the mouth of every Jew and declare, Yisgad al v'yisgad Rabba. Thank you very, very much. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.